Well, aloha, good morning. Thank you so much for being here on this Wednesday on the COVID-19 Care Conversation, a place where we like to bring leaders in our community and experts to talk about the response to the coronavirus pandemic here in the islands, brought to you, of course, by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Pacific Health. Good morning, I'm Yanji Denise. And I'm Ryan Kalei Of course, we want to thank all of you for tuning in here this morning and uh, for already saying hello. We'd like to see those comments coming in and like to know where you're watching from. So we encourage you to get involved in the conversation. Let us know where you're watching from and to spread this conversation today. We have a, a doctor in the house from Hawaii Pacific Health. We're going to be talking a little bit more about, of course, COVID-19, uh, sort of the efforts that are continue to happen and sort of the plan moving forward as more and more hospitals be, and, and doctors begin seeing patients and some of the tips that they can provide. We have Dr. Uh, Leslie Chun from HPH that will be joining us in just a little bit. But first, we'd like to, of course, start off with some of an up with an update on some of the cases uh, and the new count for the COVID-19 cases here in the state of Hawaii. And as of yesterday, one new case reported, bringing that total to 653 positive cases since the outbreak began. Uh, again, that is good news as we continue to see more single digit days. We have heard from officials though that those numbers expected to rise as more and more things become open. And, and of course, as we see neighbor island travel begin once again uh, coming up in a few weeks. Yeah, I mean, the wonderful thing to see is just one new case and no new deaths for a month now. More than 95% of people who have been infected have recovered. So that's great to see. And it's easy to get sort of casual, lackadaisical when it comes to social distancing, wearing those masks, doing all the things that we know we need to do. But to keep those numbers where they are, we really do need to abide by those uh, by those restrictions. And the other thing that the state is doing, this is headline news today in the paper, state health officials are working to build up a team of public health workers. Um, they're trying to hire over 300, the Department of Health, hiring over 300 contact tracers who will be uh, in place by mid-July. That's in anticipation of what Ryan just talked about, a, a expected surge. So contact tracing is so, so important. So good to see that the state is taking those measures. Now you can read more about exactly how that program is going to work, who they're hiring and how they're training them. That's today in today's paper. That's right. And to talk a little bit more, of course, about uh, the state of COVID-19 in the state, as well as other health related issues. We have Dr. Chen joining us now from Hawaii Pacific Health. Uh, thank you, doctor, for joining us this morning and for being here with us. Uh, first, if you can sort of provide uh, a little bit of an update as to what you folks are seeing in the hospitals and some of the medical offices at Hawaii Pacific Health in regards to COVID-19. Thanks, Ryan and Yunji, for having me here. Um, and thank you to all your listeners and to the um, state of Hawaii for doing a great job flattening the curve. Um, we have very few cases throughout our state, and Hawaii, like no other place in the world, has really done a great job um, with um, uh, preventing the spread of the disease. And in terms of what we're seeing in our um, hospital as well as in our clinics is actually um, not many people are coming in or not as many people are coming in as they used to. And we are concerned that um, patients who need care um, and um, are deferring care are not seeking the care. And I, we, we believe they, they should, it's safe right now to come on in. And we've taken many measures to make our environment safe um, and, and that we can see um, people who need care. You know, we had one of your colleagues on last week talking about, you know, the dangers of ignoring a heart attack. Um, and obviously that, that's very apparent why you can't do that and why you shouldn't delay seeing a cardiologist or calling 911. But there are some other uh, practices that you might not think of. Why is it important, let's say, to make that contact with a primary care provider or to establish those relationships? Because I think a lot of people say, oh, the hospital is the last place I wanna be right now, given that there's COVID, maybe I'll wait a few months. What do you say to those folks? I would say, you know, back in March, we did ask our community to defer care, um, to um, prevent the spread of the disease, as well as to preserve uh, PPE. But right now with the low number of cases out there and what we've learned so far about the disease, we know, um, that patients need care and that we can keep them safe. And we just have this full array at Hawaii Pacific Health of ways to help our patients from um, e-messaging, which you might not think that you could e-message your physician, but that's possible through Hawaii Pacific Health, to the normal telephone visit. You can do a telephone call with your physician to now um, a video conference like FaceTime or the, or the like through our platform. Um, and then 
urgent care um, without an appointment, seeking care, you can do that virtually or in person. And then finally, the good old in-person visit with your physician. What we've learned is that um, the, the bond between the physician and the patient is the most important thing, and we've always known that. And now just there's different technological ways of, of getting that care and continuing that bond. Um, if I may, it's like um, family members. You may not see them physically all the time, but a phone call, a text, uh, a quote unquote virtual visit with them means a lot. And you can solve um, difficult issues and address difficult things through that. And so we wanna make sure patients and the community know we at Hawaii Pacific Health and the broader uh, physician and clinician community are here to, here to help you and to make sure you're healthier um, and, and that you don't defer care at this time. And in some ways, this is actually one of the safest times and given the, the low numbers of cases um, within our community and how much we've learned as a, um, as a entity of how to keep people safe. Let's bring in the audience. Uh, Ryan, do you see that question from Danielle about, about uh, masks? What science shows that cloth masks are effective? You know, doctor, whenever we have a physician on here, um, we always get lots of questions about masks and we see all kinds of masks, the cloth mask that uh, Danielle is asking about. I also see a lot of people wearing what look like kind of higher tech masks with the little filters on it. Yeah. Uh, why are those not the best? And also Danielle's questions about cloth. Great question, Danielle and Yunji. So one, masks are highly effective in helping prevent the spread of the disease. Um, but there's two parts of it. One is protecting others. And in Asia, where mask wearing has been part of the tradition for uh, longer than in the US, um, it's sort of viewed as, if you're not wearing a mask, why are you not protecting me from what you're breathing out? And so that's one way. It's, it's preventing those particles from getting into the air and potentially infecting others. Um, the other side, which cloth masks do, which isn't as effective, but it still does some, is that if there are large particles out there, that it prevents it from getting to your nose and mouth. Um, but your question about vented masks is actually a very important one. In some communities, um, such as in California, those are actually banned. And the reason for that, um, and, certain, and actually within Hawaii Pacific Health, those are not allowed within the hospital and within the clinics. And the reason for that is the mask might protect yourself um, if you're wearing it, but through that vent, it's actually, a, a, it, it, all, all your respiratory, um, uh, aerosols are, are coming out through that hole and you're not protecting others. So again, you may be protecting yourself, but not others through a vented mask. And that's why um, in general, um, we, we don't want those to be used or, or um, in, in, in our medical centers, as well as um, in the community. You know, one of the things of course that we're hearing a lot of talk about is a potential second wave uh, as travel begins to open up again and as more people begin coming into the state, regardless of you know whatever restrictions that the state does indeed implement for these incoming visitors. Uh, what is Hawaii Pacific Health doing, uh, and what are the hospitals that you know fall under the jurisdiction of Hawaii Pacific Health doing to maybe prepare for this? Uh, we know that during this first you know this first wave, so to speak, that a lot of things were just kind of put together, uh, and, and that it was a kind of feverish pace here. What are some of the things that are being implemented to prepare for a potential second wave like that? That's a great question, Ryan. So. When tourism reopens, um, there is no doubt that we will see an increased number of cases. Hopefully we'll have the things in place, like you mentioned, in terms of good contact tracing, a good amount of tests to help control and uh, help keep the, the virus at bay. Um, but when that does come and when that happens, um, Hawaii Pacific Health, um, our four hospitals, Kapiolani, Straub, Polymomi, and Wilcox, as well as our surgery center out at Restaurant Rural, um, have implemented a number of things to help um, prepare for this and to help keep our clinicians and the public um, safe. One is temperature screenings and questioning upon entering our facility. The next is the mandatory use of masks. Um, the next is just making sure that we have proper uh, physical distancing. Um, those are things that are just in terms of the prevention of the spread. In terms of preparations broader, um, we have a good supply of um, PPE. We have good protocols. Um, in place to protect um, providers as well as um, patients when they're having procedures done or being admitted to the hospital or just being seen one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And that includes um, at the very basic level, um, everybody wearing a mask as well as a face shield. 
I'm curious to know what kind of a tra what kind of a decrease in traffic your physicians have seen. Uh, when we talked to uh, the cardiologist last week, he was saying it was about thirty percent off in the ER, and and probably more than that just in his practice. That was Dr. Huidi Shu. Um, I'm I'm just curious in other areas where you've seen the the largest drop, and and what you really want people to do because. Um, you know, you might not think you might not feel sick now, obviously, but as you said earlier in this broadcast, establishing that relationship with your primary care physician is very important. Um, and also, if you could talk about if you don't have a primary care physician, uh, why might now be a good time to get one? Sure. So great questions. So we have seen a drop off in both the urgent visits as well as the non urgent visits. And right now, um, it's not back to business as usual. I mean, we're, we're certainly using other modalities, but in terms of all your medical questions and issues um, should be addressed in a timely manner, whether they're urgent, emergent, or just a, a chronic disease, or even just basic primary care of keeping yourself healthy. Um, and those visits, again, can be do, done through many different modalities, um, whether it's from simple as e-messaging to in-person. We should not wait at this time. It's not only safe to come in, but it's also um, smart to, to address your clinical needs now instead of waiting in the future. Um, if we do, when we do have another wave of, of patients, of, of COVID cases, if it gets too large, um, there is a chance of another shutdown and that you don't want to be waiting indefinitely for getting your care. And so that, that window of time is now and um, the, the, the systems are in place to keep you safe and there's many different modalities to, to interact with your clinicians. Um, and, and, and finally, in terms of the, the primary care doctor, many people might not have a primary care doctor, but you actually can call in um, to Hawaii Pacific Health, and I think our number is 643 uh, doc and they can establish that relationship virtually if there's nothing urgent, um, or if there's something urgent, they can do it, um, or something needs to be seen physically in person, and you can develop that relationship so it, over time. And um, again, that bond is super important. You know, we're seeing some questions coming in here about antibody testing. Uh, we know that is something that Hawaii Pacific Health has taken on uh, with its own workers and employees. Uh, what can you uh, tell us about the antibody testing, uh, specifically what you folks have done there uh, with the workers at, at Hawaii Pacific Health and what, and what you're seeing with some of those um, testing that's being done? Sure, so there's two types of tests. One is the nasal swab test that actually looks for the virus. And then the antibody testing is actually a test that looks at um, does your body ha has your body seen the coronavirus and has have an immune response to that. Um, so at Hawaii Pacific Health, we were leaders in this area um, where we actually offered it to all our physicians and as well as all our um, all our employees to get tested. And um, almost over four thousand um, um, people have gotten the test along with a questionnaire. And what we've seen is that um, a very, very small percentage of people have the antibodies to the coronavirus, which is reassuring to us in that we do have um, clinicians in touch with COVID patients and that we provide them with the right um, personal protective um, equipment and have protected them well, that there's not these uh, large numbers of people in our system um, that were, were exposed unduly. Um, and so it's been a very uh, fruitful thing for us to help reassure ourselves. Um, the flip side is even if someone is um, antibody, uh, uh, test positive for the antibody, we don't know enough um, nationally or internationally of if that even means anything of an immune response that's effective for re-exposure to the virus. Um, when we look at, there, you know, as we start to open up, um, and I, I think you know Armando is asking the question that we all want to know, and I don't know that any of us can answer this: is how far off we, how far off are we from getting a vaccine? Winter is right around the corner. Um, you know, if if we don't get a vaccine, uh, I, I think by winter would be highly unlikely. Um, although I wish it too, Armando. Um, you know, how should we continue to adapt our behavior because it is very trying on people. It is very stressful to you know. Um, constantly have this on our minds. What, what do you tell folks about living with COVID and how we can adapt? Yeah, so one in terms of the vaccine, um, I think um, Dr. Fauci just um, shared that there is some promising um, vaccines out there that they're looking at and that they don't know the efficacy now, but they're thinking 
in early 2021 that they, um, the United States will have 100 million doses, which is a lot. Um, so if it is effective, then we could immediately start using them. So that's one, and I think that's much earlier than we thought um, that possible. And again, we don't know if that's effective or not, but certainly that's in production. But regardless of whether we have a vaccine or not, um, your question, Yunji, about um, how do we keep ourselves safe? And what we do know now is certainly masks, as we talked about earlier, um, certainly um, uh, physical distancing to make sure you're not in, in uh, close contact, general um, good hand hygiene to make sure you're not um, touching things and then touching your mouth and your eyes. That's certainly a spread of things. Um, and then really just questioning um, whether you're in large groups or not. Um, it, it's, it's known that if you're in crowded spaces and with a lot of people, your risk of, of being in touch with someone with COVID as well as tra um, them transmitting the disease to you is a much higher risk. And I think that's here to stay for, um, for quite a while. And I think integrating that in um, your daily life as that as Hawaii reopens and the Kamaana economy reopens is is important. I'm not sure you can speak directly to this question, but we have a question from Alex here about plasma treatment. And uh, can anyone get tested to be considered for plasma uh, testing? Is Hawaii utilizing plasma treatment? Uh, I, I think we have seen this done in the mainland uh, successfully with those who had COVID and, and plasma being an effective tool for that. Uh, have you heard heard any updates here locally about that? Sure. So what's behind the um, the plasma is that people who had COVID and have an antibody against it, the belief is that if you donate your plasma, that that can be infused into um, patients that have COVID and potentially help them um, combat um, the virus. Um, the Blood Bank of Hawaii is very active in that and are seeking donors. Um, so that's certainly active here in Hawaii. Um, I don't know offhand um, how many patients, if any, have received it here in Hawaii, um, but it's certainly um, they're building up that capacity through Blood Bank of Hawaii. I'm curious about that, just to follow on that. So if you have those antibodies, um, for how long is that plasma potentially an effective treatment? I know you, you, know, you can donate blood fairly regularly. Could these patients donate blood perhaps more than once? And, and could that plasma, as you say, sort of build a reserve so that we could use that if more people get infected? We, we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about the uh, coronavirus. And um, we do know there's an antibody response for those who have recovered. Um, but we don't know if those antibodies, how effective they are when we infuse them into someone else. Um, it's still sort of in that um, unknown space. Um, we also don't know how long the antibody um, is at a level within your um, your body that will be effective in the future. Um, so it's it just too many unknowns there. Um, it's promising. It's, it's, it's neat to think of it clinically and scientifically, um, but there's just not been enough experience to know. You know, Dr. Chan, our, our time is coming to uh, an end here. Uh, so I wanted to give you an opportunity maybe to just uh, your, your final thoughts uh, about maybe those who may still be apprehensive about coming in to see a doctor or um, anything, any sort of message that you would have right now to those tuning in. Thanks, Ryan. So first, the first message is just, if you need clinical care, come on in or get seen or be seen virtually. Um, we at Hawaii Pacific Health are ready to take care of you. And um, there's no reason to defer the case, whether again, urgent, emergent, or just chronic, or just meeting a physician for the first time, we're there for you. Um, broader for, for your listeners and the Hawaii community is this has been a very tough time across the board, throughout the world. Um, people have done, had personal sacrifices. Um, it's been tough on the family, tough on employment, tough on everything. But when you look into the future, um, it's, it's bright. We're gonna get through this. And, we in Hawaii can solve problems and come together as a community like no other place I know of on this planet. And whether it's the second wave or whether the current status of things clinically or economically, we're going to get there. And um, we just need to continue to understand what the fabric of Hawaii is about. And that's the connectivity, the aloha, and the love that we have for each other, that we really will combat coronavirus and whatever else the future may bring. And so that, that's what I wanted to close with, that um, we're in it together. We've gotten through that first wave successfully, and we're going to get through whatever um, life brings us. Thank you thank for the you time, so and thank you for, for um, all the great questions. 
Thank you so much, doctor. That that felt like a good dose of medicine, Ryan, for me <laughs> to, to know that we are gonna get through this because sometimes it can be pretty daunting. Thank you so much, Dr. Leslie Chun from Hawaii Pacific Health. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Uh, and we wish you a fond aloha. We want to also talk to you this morning about some unemployment questions. We know a number of you were very disappointed that uh, Scott Murakami couldn't join us. He had been a regular guest for us on Tuesdays, um, but he is shifting his attention elsewhere right now. And so um, we still asked him to continue his conversation with us. So he has allowed us to actually send him some emails with some questions that we thought kind of um, represented a number of viewers. So we went through all the questions, kind of condensed it down to just a few this morning. And uh, here's one, and uh, I'll read the question and then Ryan's going to give the response. We just got these emailed back and forth. Uh, Barbara asked us, if a mistake is made on a claim, can a new file be created to correct the claim rather than continue to wait for an examiner to call us? So in other words, if you made a mistake, you know you made a mistake, can you just start all over? So Ryan, what did he say? Well, again, I am speaking not on behalf of me. Uh, I'm speaking, I'm giving the answers, but please do not uh, direct your questions directly at me uh, because I'm not the one, from, I'm just reading the answers essentially. So, uh, you know, what, what their response was that uh, they said that the porter does not allow an individual to file multiple claims. Uh, so basically that if you had made a mistake and uh, you want to correct, you have to unfortunately wait for that examiner to call you back some have already begun to file another claim which sort of flagged those claims that initial claim and that kind of can cause an even more backlog as you sort of get put into another category so unfortunately if you've made a mistake and you recognize what the mistake is they're still suggesting for you to hold on until you get contacted by an examiner uh, albeit it might take some time because we know a lot of people are still waiting to get that resolved but their suggestion is not to file a new individual claim Okay, let's get to the next question. Is there a way to get updates on backdated questions and updates? I know a lot of you, um, you may have gotten, you know, that that first payment, but you didn't get the ones going all the way back to whenever you separated from your employer. So what's the answer for Carl? So the, the uh, answer for that would be that the staff is currently working on backdating backlog. They recognize that there is a number of people who have not heard back and recognize that people have been emailing the backdated email. They have a dedicated team that is working to sort of go through all of those emails because not only are they having to uh, sort of address the emails that are coming in, but they're having to look at each of those individual claims that they pull up through the backdated email. And so they are just asking for patience with that, uh, that they recognize that there is a backlog. They have a team, the neighbor island teams, I believe, is what we've heard Scott Murakami talk about in the past that are addressing directly that backdating issue. So uh, we know that this is a question that often came up in our conversations and continue to be one that continues to frustrate people about that backlog. Okay, and the last question that we sent over was one about PUA. Is there a direct number or email for PUA questions? That's, of course, separate from unemployment uh, insurance. What's the best way to speak with someone specifically on a PUA claim that came from Joan? Yeah, so these questions, of course, are separate from uh, what are often filed with the unemployment benefits that were already, you know, that began earlier on. We know that PUA came out later, so they actually set up this contact support uh, portal, so to speak, for those people who have questions about the PUA specific um, application process to go ahead and head over to that um, website or that web portal to get more information and to submit your questions uh, directly to them there. Uh, they also have a dedicated team that is handling PUA claims specifically. So uh, you recommended to actually go over there to file those questions that you may have about pool and for those people who may be tuning in we will put this in our show notes after the show is done so that uh, we know that there's a lot of uh symbols and uh, letters in there so uh it's often easy to get that incorrect so we will actually try just copy and paste this over and provide that for those of you who may have questions about pool but they're asking to go specifically there so uh those again were just some of the questions that we got uh, again we tried to bunch them together based on the sort of the categories that we're seeing. Um, again, we we are not, uh, we don't have a scheduled time to have Scott Murakami back on here. We're hoping to get him back on maybe later this month. Um, and so we will, they'll continue to try to get answers. So if you have unemployment questions, you can continue to enter them into our comments and uh, we will continue to be sending that over to their office and we'll bring up the ones that we can get answers to uh, as soon as we get that information. 
We always like to leave you on a good note, and we have a uh, group of young people that we want to highlight today as our Hawaii hero. This is a group of UH College engineering students that are setting out to solve real world problems through the Community Innovation Mentorship Program. This is part of TRUE, which is an initiative of the Hawaii Exec Executive Collaborative aiming to tech enable organizations through collaboration and sharing solutions. So what these seven undergraduate computer science students did uh, from the engineering school was actually develop a tech-based solution to ease the pain point at Honolulu Animal Quarantine Holding Facility. Uh, this is of course so important to digitize this process because that's so important in the age of COVID with social distancing. So the team used technology to streamline the intake pot process and the queuing of people and pets. So now owners can see in real time exactly where their pet is in the process. This is a very cool thing. Um, so companies that might be interested in providing students with opportunities like this uh, to take on real world challenges or want to serve as a program resource should contact TRUE, that's T-R-U-E, at hec.org. So mahalo to these students. I know a lot of pet owners are happy to see that because that's always, I'm sure, pretty nerve wracking as your pet goes through the quarantine process. So we love to see that uh, partnering between students and the community to create real world solutions. That's right. So again, we uh, mahalo to all of you who are, are continuing to submit your Hawaii heroes. Uh, we're getting a wide variety of them and we encourage you to continue to let us know uh, who out there is inspiring you and is doing good in your uh, in our community during this time? Uh, make sure that you enter in that information in the comment section, and we'd love to highlight them here on the COVID Care Conversation. Now, uh, this week continuing to be a busy week for us here on our COVID nineteen Care Conversation platform. Uh, tomorrow, we will be speaking with the head of the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, Mufi Hanneman, to learn a little bit more about the state's efforts uh, and, and the relationship with with the state to sort of bring as we could potentially bring back tourists to the islands how uh, the hospitality industry is preparing we've heard vocal uh, opposition again by some of those who work in the hospitality industry saying that they don't feel safe uh, and that there is not enough being done we want to get an update on what some of the ho hotels and others in the hospitality industry are doing to really protect those uh, who work in the the hotel industry as well as to protect those visitors coming in so looking forward to that conversation we'll also be talking with a representative from Hawaiian Airlines on Friday. Yeah, that's right. P Peter Ingram, who is the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines, will be joining us. We saw an article in the paper just yesterday about the steps that Hawaiian is taking now, keeping that middle row evacuated so that there's distance between passengers, some steps that they're taking to actually sanitize the planes. But what does air travel look like? Uh, you know, in a post COVID world and will it be enough? You know, they're opening the Kama'aina economy, so to speak, and allowing inner island travel to resume in the middle of this month. But will that be enough flights to sustain this airline? Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, when he was on, said that if we had an opening and then a quick shutdown again, he worried that Hawaiian Airlines would actually go out of business. So we wanna know what is it going to take to make sure that our hometown airline actually stays in business. We know a lot of people rely on those jobs and also a lot of people rely on that transportation for business, for medical care. And also if you're like me and Ryan, our moms live on another island. So uh, we take Hawaiian all the time to go see our family on the big island. And so it's very important, of course, that, uh, that this airline does stay afloat. And so how does that happen uh, given all the challenges right now? That's right. So if you have questions for any of those who we encourage you to tune in uh, again at 1030 on Thursday and on Friday. And then next week, another full week, we have uh, Governor Ige, another doctor, as well as Dave Matlin from the University of Hawaii, who will be coming on. We want to know a little bit more about how Hawaii Athletics plans to sort of move forward in this time with so many question marks about travel and pre uh, protecting athletes and coaches. Uh, so we'll be talking to him about how the University of Hawaii Athletics program is moving forward here in this uh, COVID-19 era, so to speak. So we look forward to all those conversations. And again, we thank all of you for continuing to tune in each and every day uh, for submitting your questions and for being a part of this important conversation. We thank our sponsors, the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Health for bringing you this conversation. And of course, if you have more uh, information that you need, please stay connected to the platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser uh, for updates and to stay connected with all things that are happening here related to COVID. Until tomorrow at 10.30, we will bid you a fond aloha and a hui ho.